This is a kipu. This is effectively a document. It's an account book. So just like we would use pen and paper to record something, this is doing the recording all through the different features of the textile. And it struck me that no nobody had accessed the information in this kipu before. And um, the closer you look at it, the more interesting it gets. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a conservator at the British Museum, and welcome to my corner. So if you watched last week's episode of Curator's Corner, you would have learned all about kipus. And this week, I'm going to tell you about this specific kipu that I've spent 47 hours looking at in detail. It's from the Inca Empire, so roughly between the 1430s and 1530s, so it's about 500 years old. And when it came into the studio, I really didn't know much about it. I basically knew it was called a kipu. Uh, but the more I learned about it, I sort of began to fall in love with it because it's so ingenious. And it's now actually become one of my favorite objects in the museum. When it came up to the studio, uh, my brief was to make sure it was safe enough to go on display at an angle in the upcoming Peru exhibition. The condition when it came in was very different to what it is now. It was a tangled mass of cords, essentially. So the first job was to untangle those cords. However, to untangle 275 cords that are, that are made of fibres that are 500 years old, um, it takes a lot of time. You have to be really, really careful because the fibres are really brittle. They're very, very prone to powdering. And the cords were really liable to break every time I moved one. And in this case, I'd be literally, it's almost like tear, tearing a bit of the text and out if, if that had happened. So I just started to very carefully move each cord back into position. And at this stage now, um, scholars could come and uh, read the kipu. And what I find so fascinating about it is that this is effectively a document. It's an account book. This is doing the recording all through the different features of the textile. So you. It's the, the type of fiber, it's the number of cords that are hanging down, it's the colors that they've used to make them, it's the direction of the twist that they've made the cords with, and it's the different types of knots and where the knots are on the kipu. All tells the reader um, different bits of information. Along the top here are what is called a primary cord, and this is in fact three kipus. If you look, you can see that you've got one primary cord here, there's an overhand knot, You've got a second primary cord that again is tied with an overhand knot to a third primary cord. So we've got three separate kipus that have been tied together. And hanging down from the kipus are what we're calling pendant cords. And each pendant cord has a series of knots tied into it. And those knots are what is recording, in this case, numerical information for someone else to read. So there's essentially two registers of where the knots lie. There's a lower register that broadly runs about here for the one, so between one and nine. Then there's a second register broadly running about here, and that register is for the tens. Um, and so the way you would read the numbers that are recorded in this kipu, you'd start with the tens. There's only one type of knot that are used for the tens, and so it's an overhand knot. So if you come across two overhand knots, that's 20, four overhand knots, that's 40, etc. Then you move down to the ones. There's two different types of knots here. If it's a, a unit of one, it's a certain type of knot. But if it's a unit of two to nine, it's a type of knot that has loops. And so you count the loops. So if there's four loops, it's a number four, nine loops, number nine. Let's look at reading this light cord here. Um, so we're gonna start with the top register. And there's a whole bunch of overhand knots. I have to say, I still find it really hard to differentiate between the overhand knots. But I think we're going to, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think that's seven. And then we come down to um, the, the one to nines or, or zero. If there's no knot, it's obviously zero. So here we've got a nice big number here to count. Um, so we're going to count the loops. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Okay, so we've got 78. So that, that cord is recording 78. Often we think of treatment as being quite hands-on and interventive. But in this case, 
one of the main jobs of the treatment was to actually make the information in the kipu accessible and get it out into the wider world so scholars could use that information. And one of my favorite parts was, in fact, learning about the Open Kipu Repository. This is a database that's managed by John Clendaniel at the University of Chicago. They're trying to put all the information of kipus from around the world into the repository, and scholars can access it freely and use it to start making connections. And it struck me that no nobody had accessed the information in this kipu before. No one had actually read the kipu. So the brief, I suppose, became bigger because this was an opportunity now to, to contribute knowledge to that repository. And so the next stage of the treatment was documenting the data that this kipu held. Every pendant cord was measured, uh, the spin was described, the ply, the color was described. Knots can be knotted in the S direction or they can be knotted in the Z direction. Equally, the way the pendant cord attaches to the primary cord can be done in one direction or another direction. So all these small details are recorded in the database because they're all a conscious choice. By put, putting all the information into an Excel spreadsheet, I could start to see patterns. So for example, off of these pendant cords are often another cord that hangs off of it, which is called a subsidiary cord. And what I could see in that database Within certain sections of the kipu, I would look at all, for example, the first subsidiary cords. So I'm looking at each first one, and they all were the same color. And then I'm looking at the second subsidiary cord, and they too were all the same color. So you're starting to see patterns, very obvious choices that the maker of this kipu made. Why they made it is a different question, but at least we can start to decipher what those patterns are from the repository. One of the things I find fascinating about it and the reason it is my favorite object is just the ingenuity behind it and the fact that someone would have picked this up and run their hands down each pendant cord and gotten such a wealth of information. I mean what that information is we don't know yet but it's something along the lines of how many how much goods was given to the community, what type of labor was paid, um, who owed what, that kind of thing, but they would just run their hands and they could feel the type of knot, the number of knots, the type of fiber, the ply, all that. Just reinforced to me that this is data and how objects have information in them. They can give us so much information about different cultures, past, present, and about ourselves. So if you'd like to come and see the kipu in real life at the British Museum, it's going into the Peru exhibition and all the details are just below me. <laughs>